Righty. Welcome to a, another Healthy Gamer GG stream. My name is Alok Kanoja. Just a reminder that although I'm a psychiatrist, nothing we discuss on stream today is intended to be taken as medical advice. Everything is for educational or entertainment purposes only. If y'all have a concern or question, please go see a licensed professional. Welcome, everybody. Happy Monday. I've been streaming a little bit more recently. Um, and that's fun. So I'm looking forward to doing more streaming. We've been in town. I've been traveling a lot this year. 
went to like all the stuff out in California, like the Streamies and the American Psychiatric Association Conference and VidCon and like all these different cons and conventions and conferences and award shows and whatnot. The occasional podcast. Um, I was on the Iced Coffee Hour podcast recently, and I hear that people are enjoying it quite a bit. So if you guys are interested, it was like a three hour podcast. So for those of y'all that are into long form content by Dr. K, I highly recommend y'all check it out. Um, I'm sure that someone can link it somehow, somewhere, some, some who, but it was a, a lot of fun. It, it was one of my favorite podcasts. So there's a couple of other th announcements we've got. Um, the first is that this Friday, we are going to have uh, an awesome guest, Dr. Uma Naidu, who is an expert on food and mood. So she's a psychiatrist, like I'm sure she's on the faculty at Harvard Medical School, works at, I think, MGH, Mass General Hospital. Um, and she's written a couple of books about the impact of food in psychiatry. And I know that there's all this gut microbiome stuff going on, but she was talking about food in psychiatry before it was cool. So she's going to be on this Friday, and we're going to learn a little bit about food and mood. Um, and yeah. So check that out. The other thing, just to let y'all know, we recently started YouTube memberships. So this is for people who are interested in more in-depth content. Basically for 10 bucks a month, you guys get four additional lectures that are one hour in length plus Q and A. Um, the topics of lectures are actually determined by the community. So for those of y'all that want like more stuff that is a little bit more in depth and y'all want to pick what Dr. K, uh, Lect builds a lecture on that's what kind of memberships are for the money from memberships goes on to fund all of the other things that we do including all of our free content so we're committed to trying to make mental health resources as accessible as possible but as we discussed on friday built the more free stuff that you build the more money that you need right which is i think sometimes something that people miss out on so we're incredibly grateful to everyone who just watches our videos, who donates and stuff like that. Um, but a big part of what we really try to do is deliver value when we ask y'all for money. So we're trying to offer some value. Um, so definitely check out memberships. The the lectures for this week, I mean, th this month are around male mental health. So we did one lecture on managing expectations as a man. This week, we're going to talk about um, how to deal with I think it's this week. Is it this week or next week? Let me see. Yep. So this Wednesday, so in two days, we're going to do a lecture on healthy versus toxic masculinity and where toxic masculinity comes from and where healthy masculinity comes from. So, um, and then next week, we're going to have emotions 101 for men. So like how to understand emotions as a man and how emotions are even different for men. And then on the last week, we're going to do a deep dive into depression for men. So what are the male-specific manifestations of depression? Um, so, and then this month, the reason we're focusing on male mental health is we polled the community, and this is what people were interested in. But on starting on December 15th, we get to vote, or y'all get to vote for what we do in the following month. Uh, for those of y'all that are interested in more long-form content, we some people were a little bit upset that we're paywalling stuff. That's not really our intention. We're not reducing the amount of free content that we build. In fact, it funds all the free stuff that we do. So that's kind of why we're doing it. If y'all are interested in that, please sign up. We'd really appreciate your support and we hope that you'll get something out of it. A couple of other things. Um, oh yeah, and then there's a second tier at $15 a month that is basically if y'all want to give us extra money. So you will get access to certain features like right in the fields or other beta tools that we're developing before other people. But really, if y'all want to support the work that we're doing, we're giving y'all a second option for that at 15 bucks a month. Um, the goal of this is also to make things more accessible. So we you know, have other services like coaching or even Dr. K's guide, which is fantastic. But uh, those are like 25 bucks uh, a pop for the guides. So we, we tried to find something that's a little bit more affordable for people. So if y'all are interested, sign up. Um, female mental health. Yes, we're going to talk about that today, actually. So today we're doing something kind of cool. We are talking about ADHD. And what we're talking about today is a little bit different. 
yeah, so even other topics that are not gender centered. I completely agree. So I don't know if you guys know this, but like 95% of the content that we make is not gender specific. It's just life stuff. So today we're going to be talking about ADHD. There's going to be one segment that we do that is gender specific, which I think is really cool and fascinating, um, which is the impact of ADHD and menstrual cycles. So how does menstrual, how do menstrual cycles affect ADHD? But we're going to talk about ADHD as a whole. So today, what we're really doing is talking about ADHD, but we're taking a particular approach to it. So as the internet has grown, and as platforms like TikTok and YouTube Shorts and Instagram Reels and stuff like that start to come out, we've seen a plethora of content about this feature makes me ADHD, right? So if you have this, then you have ADHD. If you have trouble studying, then you've got ADHD. If you sometimes forget where you put things, then you have ADHD. So we have a lot of self-diagnosis and very like things where people will say like, if you've got this, you've got ADHD. So today what we're going to do is dive through a lot of these very common misconceptions and talk about whether they are indicative of ADHD or not indicative of ADHD. Um, and so that's the goal for today. So we're going to like jump through a bunch of different things that get propagated on social media as like, I never realized this was an ADHD thing. Okay. And we're going to dive into the science of it. So for those of y'all that are interested in long form content, we hope that today will satisfy you because, um, we're going to really like dive into a lot of the scientific features of various aspects of ADHD. Um, Okay. Wait, it affects periods? I had no idea. Yeah, it's going to be cool. I mean, it's not cool. It's unfortunate, but... Um, can you also make specific content for women? Yes, we have done that in the past, and we will continue to do so. And for those of y'all that are interested in more long-form content, we've got like 800 videos on our YouTube channel, many of which are like over an hour in length. So y'all should check those out. Um, okay. Questions before we begin. How can I free myself from you? I freak out that I will miss out on bettering myself if I miss a video. If you disappear, I'm scared I will fall apart and I don't like this dependency. Yeah. Let me think about how to answer that. Hmm. How can I answer that? Um, yeah, so it's not freeing yourself from me. So let's understand this. When we have an insecurity... Our insecurity will find a face for it to latch onto. So even if I disappeared, it may be traumatic for a little while, but then you will find something else to be dependent on. And so the reason that people become dependent on Dr. K is not because I'm the best thing since sliced bread. I know it's crazy to say as a narcissistic streamer, but sometimes in life, if we feel insecure about ourselves, we need someone else to lean on. And we start to think to ourselves that as long as this person is here, then I will be safe. Right? But this has nothing to do with me or whoever the person is that you're dependent on. It has to do with the fact that you are dependent on something. You need to be dependent on something. Why? Because you lack faith in yourself that you can do it right. Without this pillar, I will fall apart. And so the real way to fix this is to really recognize why you need someone else to be there. Right? Why? What would happen if I ceased to exist? And how much of an impact do I really have? I'm a random person on the internet who like is talking at you, not even talking to you. Right? And how much impact can I have? We can teach you a lot. I'm not saying that we don't offer good educational resources, but we're not out here like saving lives right, left, and center. Like we sometimes people will say, Yeah, you saved my life or you changed my life or whatever. So we'll take that credit. We're not saying it doesn't happen. But the key thing to understand is even if you say, oh, Dr. K, you, you changed my life, it's not like I was the only one who could, right? So for someone to say, okay, you changed my life, that requires a lot of effort on your part. In fact, it requires more effort on your part than it does on my part. All I have to do is talk to a camera or a computer screen, and the rest of it is you. So if you feel like someone is really good at helping you and that you cannot survive without them, I want you to really pay attention to how much they do and how much you do. Because chances are you do 90% of it. They just give you some guardrails. They give you a little bit of guidance. They give you a little bit of direction. But you're the one who's doing all the walking. 
So it can feel scary to lose someone. But trust in yourself. Even if you lose the rest of the world, at least you'll have you. Okay? Do you have a narcissistic per personality, Dr. K? Personality? Y'all tell me, chat. Is Dr. K narcissistic? What do y'all think? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think I'm very narcissistic. I'd guess that I'd test quite low on the narcissism scale, but maybe that's what all narcissists think. So you never know. Um, okay. Oh yeah. I mean, there's so much good stuff about autism. All right. So other stuff that we, we want to come up with, I'm, I'm working on a deep dive on, on asexuality, which I'm excited about, but let's start. Mm. Okay, let's do this one here. Okay. Okay, let's get started. What do y'all think? Should we get started? That's what a narc would say. Yeah, so it looks like, man, I'm narcissistic. I'm a raging narcissist. Now, here's the question. Would a raging narcissist admit they are a raging narcissist? Probably not, right? So now this is where we get to Schrodinger's narcissist, where if I don't say I'm a narcissist, I am a narcissist. But if I say I'm a narcissist, a narcissist would never say that. So which is it, chat? Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Trapped you, chat. Yeah, it's really good. So here's what I would say. I am what I am. If it is a narcissist, I accept it. If it is not a narcissist, I also accept it. I am what I am. And my goal is to try to be a little bit better today than I was yesterday. So where I where I am is irrelevant. The question is, which direction am I going? Do you all get that? If every narcissist on the planet adopted my worldview, then no narcissist would exist. <laughs> right? It's, oh my God, if everyone just did what I did, oh my God, all the narcissists would disappear. Everyone just needs to do what I'm doing. And then they would be not as narcissistic as I am. Right? That's good. Um, <laughs> this is fun. We can do this all day long. We can go as many rounds as y'all want. You guys like how at the first part of that, before I started trolling y'all, you're all like, man, that's so great. Like, look at this guy. Oh my God. He's like, he should, he should be an influencer because he's so positive and he spreads spot. Oh my God. That's right. You just need to be better than you, who you are yesterday. Yeah. Let me gobble that shit up. Mm, that positivity. Oh yeah, baby. Let's go. Um, yeah, I walked right into it. You're damn right. <laughs> how else am I supposed to have a good time? This isn't just about y'all's entertainment and education, okay? I get to have fun too. Is alexithymia related to ADHD? What a great question. Okay. Let's get started. Mm. Okay, let me see. Stuff, blindness. Mm, okay. Oh, whoops. Okay, let's do, all right, so today what we're going to talk about is a number of things. I don't know what to get started with, chat, so I'm going to need your help. I don't know if there are mods around, but here are the things that we're going to cover. ADHD things that are not in the DSM. Stuff blindness. I left my vibrator on the sink. That's going to get clipped out of context, chat. Um... Are problems with authority and ADHD thing? I thought I'd outgrow that ADHD annoyance, but here I am at 24 acting the same as I did at 12. Do you feel like an actual child? Eh. Okay, we'll get to that. Cracking the seal. 
um, this is a good one. Is starting over several times in your life an ADHD thing? Is it ADHD to copy people's quirks and distracted during sex? And then we also have women with ADHD. Does your executive dysfunction, depressive symptoms get worse during your period? Which one do y'all want to do, chat? Any takers? I'm going to randomly look at stuff. Um, yeah, the 12 one. Okay. Okay, let's do it. We're going to do all of it. It's just what order. What to join, what a quote to join on. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> Time to have fun. The vibrator one, please. Okay. Looks like someone is farming clips for LSF. Okay. Two. Stuff blindness. Okay, it looks like most people want to do two. Or is it the same people that are spamming things? Oh my god, I'm getting so taken advantage of. That's fine. We'll start with this one. Stuff blindness. I once left my vibrator on the sink when having friends over for the evening. Anyone become totally blind to things once they've been there for a day or two? I don't have people over often because my house is usually a complete mess and I'm a bit of a hermit. However, last year I did have some friends over for drinks, smokes, and board games. All went well, had a great evening together, and they went home. I then realized when brushing my teeth that my mm, vibrator dildo, the rabbit type one, I don't even know what that means. I didn't realize there were animal. What does that even mean? The rabbit type one. Does that mean that there are dildos that are modeled after various animals? Have been set on the edge? I feel like I'm too innocent for the internet. Had been set on the edge of the sink the whole time. I had been to the toilet a few times, as had my friends, and just hadn't noticed. Or I assume any of the looks given to me my friends to alert me, I assume they would do this. My stomach dropped when I realized, and I spiraled into a massive meltdown, but now it's been like a year, I find it hilarious. Um, okay. So is stuff blindness with ADHD a thing? Now, a lot of times what'll happen is you'll have someone who says like, oh my God, is your house a mess? Do your, do you leave your vibrator on the sink? If so, you've got ADHD. Is this a thing? The answer is actually, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a thing. So let's understand a couple of things about attention and the environment when it comes to ADHD. So our brain has a couple of different ways that it processes information. It has something called top-down processing, and it has something called bottom-up processing. So bottom-up processing is when we sort of get lots of stimuli from the environment, and then something gets floated to the surface, okay? And top-down processing is when we tell our mind to focus on a particular thing, and that's what it focuses on. So I'll give you all a simple example of top-down versus bottom-up processing. Let's say I'm going for a walk with my friend, and we are, we are going on this walk because my friend and I have both recently gone through divorces, knock on wood, and we are commiserating about our failed relationships. That's kind of scary. But anyway, so we're going there and my, my, I've decided that I'm talking to my friend about this. So as I'm walking down the road, there is a snake that is on the path. So in this moment, I'm telling my mind to focus on one particular thing. But then what happens is my mind is actually, my brain is processing all kinds of external stimulus. And then eventually what will happen is that the external stimulus that my mind is processing will break into my consciousness. So once I see a snake on the road, if I'm if my brain functions properly, it will alert me to the snake. So now I want to go one place with my mind, but my mind is saying, hey, there's this stimulus out here that needs to dominate your attention. And it flags it in my brain and it says, hey, there's a snake. And so then I stop thinking about my relationship and I start paying attention to the snake. This is top down versus bottom up. Now the problem in ADHD is that we are more distractible. So if we are more distractible, what that means is that we need very little, actually, let me just pull this out. I think it's gonna be go time chat. Hold on, I'm gonna redo this, okay, chat. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, 
we're gonna do this. We're gonna do this. So let's let's redo this. I need to draw this out, my dudes. My right, friends, bear with me for a moment, okay? Okay. So let's take a look at this. In ADHD, we have top. Oh, blue. Okay. I need white. I'm OCD. <laughs> so we have top down processing. And we have bottom up processing. And these two things determine what is in our mind at a given moment. So this is when I tell my mind to focus. So the reason we call this top down is because from the top you have the dictator and you tell your mind, hey, this is the direction we're going. And the mind is like, okay, if we're lucky. And in bottom-up processing, we have sensory inputs that then we get alerted to. So if I see a snack, this is a snack with a forked tongue, then it breaks into our mind, okay? Now let's take a look at how this, is, this system is different in ADHD. So in ADHD, our top-down processing is weaker, okay? And... What does that mean? That means that our frontal lobes, so this is frontal lobes, if we tell our brain to do something, someone with ADHD, their brain has trouble following the command, right? We're more vulnerable to distraction, so we're more distractible. Now, if we look at what does distractibility mean, that means that if I'm focusing on one thing, if I'm going in this direction, that a new sensory input can make me go in this direction instead. So now that there's a new sensory input, I can't control my mind. So what this sort of means is that the bottom-up processing is way stronger in ADHD. And so what this literally means is that it's easy for something in the environment to distract me. So if you look at kids who have ADHD, for example, you try to get them to read a book, but then like a car drives by and they look at the car. Or someone walks by or they see a lollipop over here and they run over there. So they're highly distractible. They can't regulate their sensory input. So then what happens over time is with ADHD, we start to form an adaptation where we learn that, okay, we're way too vulnerable to this and our top-down processing is weak. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to overcompensate and start to suppress stimuli from the environment. So I'm going to start ignoring stuff. Okay? And so then what ends up happening is to compensate for this system, we try to, because this is what happens, our brain has a system of homeostasis, so we always form a balance. Right? So if I'm too excited, eventually I'm going to calm down. If I'm feeling very sad, then eventually I'm going to feel normal again. If my heart rate goes up, my body's going to naturally bring it down. If my heart rate dips too low, I'm naturally going to bring it up. So then what happens is people with ADHD compensate to the susceptibility of external stimuli by suppressing external stimuli. And then hopefully what happens is we will achieve some kind of balance. Now the problem with this is that when we suppress external stimuli, what ends up happening is our place becomes a mess. Why? Because if you're a normal human and you walk into your like house and everything is a mess, you get fed with that information. You're like, man, this place is a mess. I really need to clean it up. But once you have ADHD, you have this compensatory suppression of external stimuli, which then means that you ignore everything around you, except for if it is novel. So if there is something new in the environment, then with ADHD, you will pick it out right away. Over time, we begin to suppress it, okay? Now, there's an even bigger problem with this, is that this suppression of external stimuli takes cognitive resources. So if you look at the brain, 
what burns fuel in the brain the most is suppressing things. So if we suppress emotions, that fatigues will, it's one of the number three um, drain, the three largest drains of willpower include emotional suppression. Stress is a second one. I'm, I'm blanking on what the third one is at the moment. There are three major drains, maybe internal conflict. But the other thing that we know is that suppressing all of this junk in your environment takes up cognitive resources. What do we mean by take up cognitive res resources? It actually makes our top-down focusing capability weaker. So as we are suppressing... Oh, what the... Where did this come from? What on earth? What? That's creeping me out a little bit. Okay. Speaking of suppressing sensory stimuli, I don't even know what happened there. Okay, whatever. Okay, I don't know how to, how do I delete this? Okay, I don't know. We're going to just pretend it's not. What the? Okay, I'm starting a new one. That frightens me. Okay. So, when we have a messy environment... What? The rabbit vibrator, you didn't know what it was, so it was just a joke, but... How did you insert it onto the... Because it's, a, you're, it's my iPad. It's connected to my computer. But why would it show up in my notes? Because your note is popping up on my screen. So that has this showed up because of the, the rabbit vibrator? Yes. I don't even know how that works, and that's creeping me out, and we'll worry about that later because I'm trying to give a lecture about okay. ADHD and blindness, okay? All right. Okay. So messy environment requires sensory suppression. Okay. Sensory suppression uses cognitive resources. Using of cognitive resources weakens or drains our frontal lobes which in turn makes it harder for us to focus. So, you can absolutely end up with stuff blindness because we don't, we, we suppress this stuff if it's in the environment for a while. And the other key tip here is that if you want your brain to function better, if you have ADHD, you need to clean your room. Because even though you are not, you don't notice that stuff. Your brain is literally suppressing all of that sensory input, which is a cognitive load. So there are studies, I wonder if I can find it. I don't think I can find it um, right this second. But there are studies that show that when people with ADHD clean their room, that their capacity to study actually improves. So if you study in a messy space with an ADHD, you literally have less ability to focus on the task at hand, right? Because when we're studying, we're using top-down processing. So we're telling ourselves, focus on this. But there's all this crap going on over here that we're trying to suppress. Don't think about that lamp. Don't think about that mail. Don't think about this. Don't think about this. Don't think about this. Just think about this. And so as the number of things that your brain has to not think about in order to focus increases, we become more cognitively fatigued. So stuff blindness is absolutely a thing. And the most important thing that you can do to fix stuff blindness is to clean your room. When we clean our room, then what happens is, is a new stimulus in the room. If there's a vibrator next to the sink, my mind will flag that for me. And it'll say, hey, there's a vibrator next to the sink because there's only one thing. If there's one thing in a pile of things, it's hard to see. It's like those, those old books that have like, where's Waldo? And there's like a pile of all this crap. And you can't find Waldo because there's shit everywhere. This is what it's like to be in a mind of an ADHD person. Where's the vibrator? Who the fuck knows? Because there's an open toothpaste cap and there's a hairbrush and there's a hair in the sink and there's this thing over here and we're running out of toilet paper and the trash can is full and like we can't find the vibrator. Where did it go? Who knows? So if you want to fix this, you got to clean things up. As you clean things up, a single thing that you put out of place 
will get flagged in your mind and then you can address it. Also has the added advantage of anything else, literally anything that you try to do in your house if your place is clean, will allow you to focus more mental energy on it. Does that make sense? And Tontron is asking, what did I just walk into? Who the hell knows anymore? Who the hell knows? Sorry, friend. <laughs> Jordan Peterson took over Dr. K. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know how Jordan Peterson got credit for this clean your room thing. It's like cleaning your room is like a good thing to do, right? Like, can we just say, can we just clean your room, man? It's like, it's a good thing for everyone involved. Okay, questions about space blindness, stuff blindness, and ADHD. Do you have ADHD, Dr. K? I probably have subclinical ADHD. What does subclinical mean? That means that if I was tested as a kid when things were not on certain days, I may have been diagnosed, but on average, I don't think it's like so impairing. Um, okay, there's a question about, can you recommend a practice to heal alexithymia? I would definitely check out our, our video on alexithymia. I think we've got various emotional stuff, like emotional regulation techniques that we've taught in various places. So um, you can also check out like Dr. K's guide to meditation, I want to say. Where do we have alexithymic stuff? Um, yeah. Or you can check out the YouTube video. I'm sure we've, t we've done meditations for alexithymia in the past. Okay, so people are asking, what is subclinical ADHD? So if we look at ADHD, and this is a big problem with kind of the internet, right? So people say, if you have this feature, then you have ADHD. But there's a problem with this way of thinking. Let's understand this, okay? So if we say, for example, that suicidal ideation is a feature of major depressive or bipolar disorder, that does not mean that Everyone who has suicidal ideation has major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder. Many human beings can experience transient suicidal ideation in the absence of mental illness. While suicidal ideation is a feature of depression, not everyone who has suicidal ideation is depressed. And I'm using that as an extreme example on purpose. So if we look at something like ADHD, being blind to stuff doesn't mean you have ADHD. It is a feature of ADHD, but not everyone who is messy or is blind to stuff has ADHD, right? So sometimes you can be like, even my wife and I will joke about having uncle eyes. So there's a saying in my culture that women look with their eyes and men look with their voice. Now you may ask, wonder what the hell, there's a cultural significance to this. So it's like, you know, when my mom is looking for something, she will like go and look for it. But when my dad is looking for something, he will be like, hey, Uma, where is this thing? He'll just ask his wife, right? That's what Indian men do is we just ask our wives where everything is. This is called uncle eyes because we can't see it. It's like, they're like, it's in the pantry. And then I walk into the pantry and I look around and I like literally don't see it even though it's right in front of me. This is uncle eyes. We're stuff blind. So it's not that all people who are blind to stuff have ADHD. You could also be an Indian uncle. Right? So this is the big problem with a lot of this self-diagnosis stuff with ADHD. All of these things may be a feature of ADHD, but just because you have that feature does not mean that you have ADHD. And so the way we define having ADHD is you have to have enough of the stuff to the point where it impairs your daily life. So I have a lot of this stuff, but it doesn't, it's not so bad that it makes it like impossible for me to function on a day-to-day -day basis. So I get highly distracted. I can't sit down and like read a book, but I can like read a paper or like sometimes I can read like a chapter here or there, but it's really hard for me to sit down and read a book. 
I mean, sometimes I can't. I have to have the right frame of mind. Whereas for other people, it may be very easy for them to sit down and just like read a book. So you can have a lot of those features, but if let's say you need like five out of nine of these features most days of the week, I'm someone who has like three or four of those features half the days of the week. So I get close, but I'm probably not, like I check a lot of the boxes, but I probably don't, wouldn't be diagnosable. The other problem with ADHD is that it requires an impairment of function. So a big reason why a lot of people feel like they have ADHD but wouldn't get diagnosed is actually because they have compensatory mechanisms. So when everyone says, I'm ADHD, they identify with this thing, but they are so good at compensating for it, either through high IQ or developing habits or whatever other systems they develop. They develop things so to where their ADHD does not actually cause problems. It makes their life harder, but they've developed systems to protect themselves from their ADHD which the moment you start doing that, you become undiagnosable because now we're no longer impairing your function. So I probably have enough compensatory mechanisms in place, including marrying someone who protects me from my ADHD. So this is what subclinical ADHD is. This is why everyone feels like they've got it and they may not have it. Does that make sense? Okay, why are symptoms of trauma sometimes similar to neurodivergent disorders? Oh man, what a great question. This is a lit question. Love this question. Okay, and then we're going to get to the other stuff. We're going to talk about this. So, if we look at neurodivergent disorders like ADHD. Oh man, this is so good. Okay. No insertion of bunny pick, hopefully. What's going on here? Okay. Let us look at why trauma and neurodivergence look the same. Okay. So, first, let's understand neurodivergence. So, in neurodivergence, we have a number of features about our brain that are different. So, for example, we know that people who are neuro neurodivergent have difficulty with empathy, okay? So, this is both ADHD and autism spectrum disorder, all right? We also know that neurodivergent people, okay, so empathy, have difficulty with emotional awareness um, so they they have difficulty recognizing their emotions okay they also have difficulty with emotional regulation so let's just dive into this this is also ADHD and autism all of these You guys want to you guys want to see my subclinical ADHD? It's that I didn't close this parentheses. You guys see that? So let's just take one of these. So let's look at emotional regulation. So we know that for example, let's see if this is Here we go. Right? So emotional is emotional regulate dysregulation a component of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um is na emotional dysregulation is now known to play a causal role in ADHD symptomatology. Emotional dysregulation is a primary symptom in adult uh, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, right? So there's a lot of papers that show that this is the case. So what we know is that we have difficulty regulating our emotions. And if you're on the autism spectrum, we know that sometimes people on the autism spectrum can have like these meltdowns, right? They can have these like temper tantrums or like autistic meltdowns and stuff like that. So we know that uh, emotional regulation is, is difficult. So let's talk about a couple of other features. Ability to focus. So we can perseverate, which means focus way too much, or become distractible. Not focus enough. Both are features of autism and ADHD. 
So this makes sense, right? Now let's look at trauma. So the thing about trauma is trauma can do all of this stuff, but the mechanism is different. So as an example, people with trauma are prone to dissociation. All right. Now, why do people with trauma dissociate? Let's understand this. So when I'm usually trauma starts in childhood. So when I'm a kid and someone abuses me, I feel bad emotionally. But as a child, as a six-year-old child, I can't do anything about it, right? So I'm feeling hurt physically, emotionally, whatever. And then like, I can't fix the problem. I have no agency. So what ends up happening as a child is that my brain discovers that we have this ability to just stop feeling things. We're going to unplug our emotional circuitry. And we literally do this by decreasing activity in the corpus callosum. Now, the corpus callosum, I don't know if you all remember this, but we've got two hemispheres in our brain. And then we've got this thing. What the? We've got this thing that connects the two hemispheres of our brain. Here's the right brain, which is emotions. And here's the left brain, which is logic. Now, if you guys are wondering why this is backwards, it's because anytime we do anatomical drawings, we're looking from the feet. Okay, we're not... Anyway, so this is right and this is left. It's kind of confusing. So as we decrease activity across this, we are able to analyze our situation so we know what's going on, but we don't feel any emotions. So we become fully left-brained, okay? Now, when we do this, we no longer have awareness of our internal emotional state. That's what dissociation is. I don't feel anything. So now we see that these two things can look very similar to everyone, right? Because the end experience is the same. I don't know what I'm feeling. I don't feel anything. Either I can be emotionally unaware or I can be emotionally numb. In both cases, I'm not going to feel anything. I, I, I don't know what I'm feeling. Right? Does that make sense? But the mechanism is different. So this is where a lot of people that I work with who think, oh, I'm autistic or I'm ADHD, you could have trauma. You may not actually be have ADHD or aut autism. And this is what's so dangerous about self-diagnosis on the internet. The biggest problem with self-diagnosis on the internet is no one does a differential diagnosis. This is part of Diagnosis 101. So as medical doctors, anytime there is a feature, let's say I'm distractible. What we see on social media is people say, oh, if you get distracted easily, you've got ADHD. Yeah, but the whole point, the whole reason that you spend four years becoming a medical doctor and then usually years after that training to be an actual, you know, life, life a live physician is because you learn all of the other things that can cause distractibility, like substance use, trauma, menstruation. Right? There are all kinds of things that can cause distractibility. Dementia. Delirium. Developmentally appropriate. And this is kind of the problem with the WebMD diagnosis, or the Dr. Google, right? Google MD, is that you can search for a set of symptoms that will give you an answer. But the tricky thing is that there's a thousand things that can lead to distractibility, including things like grief. And so which one of these is responsible? Do you drink coffee every day? Do you use marijuana every day? Have you been traumatized? Are you on your period? Do you have dementia? Right? There's all kinds of things that can cause distractibility. So when it comes to empathy, so let's just run through a couple of these other ones, okay? So also when we come to dissociation, as we dissociate from ourselves, it becomes hard to form connections with other people. So I don't know if this kind of makes sense, but we also have depersonalization in trauma. So depersonalization is when my sense of meanness disappears. So I don't feel like a person. I feel like a robot. I feel like a, an actor in a play. I don't like feel alive, right? I kind of, it's weird. I just don't feel connected to myself, which is also a consequence of dissociation. And there's other stuff that goes on in the brain. But if you think about empathy, empathy is me forming a connection with you. In order for the two of us to form a connection, I have to have a me in the first place. So as I depersonalize, it's impossible for me to form empathy, right? Because I can't form a connection because I, I don't feel myself. Let's talk about emotional regulation or dysregulation. So here's the mechanism in ADHD. 
okay? So we have our amygdala and our limbic system. This is where emotions come from. Okay? And then we have our frontal lobes, which inhibit our emotions. So when I'm feeling angry, I will, I will say, okay, I'll look, take a deep breath, calm down. It's not the end of the world. That is my frontal lobes controlling my emotional circuitry. This connection is weak in ADHD. It's very weak. So I am not as good at controlling my emotions. Now let's take a look at trauma. So what we know from trauma is that since I spend so much time suppressing things, what ends up happening is I don't get I don't get good at controlling it because I, I don't know if this kind of makes sense, but like, you know, if I just make things disappear through dissociation, I'm not going to be good at controlling them when they show up. So there's like a difference. Let's say I have a dog. If I live with the dog every day and I focus on training the dog every day, the dog will be obedient. But if any time the dog acts up, I go and I lock it in a closet or I go put it out in the barn and I never like learn how to regulate it, every time the dog shows up, it's not going to listen to me because I never spend any time training it. So what happens in, in people who are traumatized is they get bad at regulating their emotions because they suppress their emotions so much. And they also have emotional regulation problems because the emotions that they feel are more profound. And this has to do with physiology. So their physiologic state is so wired towards tension high levels of sympathetic nervous system activity, high levels of adrenaline and cortisol. And these two hormones activate negative emotions. They stimulate our danger circuits of the brain, our survival circuits of the brain. So in the case of ADHD, we have difficulty regulating. But in the case of trauma, these things are hyperactive. The result is the same. We don't, we have difficulty regulating our emotions. Now let's talk about ability to focus. Okay. So in the case of ability to focus, like we know that this is a core feature of ADHD, but this is also a core feature of trauma. And the reason that distractibility in, is difficult or is a feature of trauma is the mechanism is a little bit different. Okay. So in the case of trauma, there's all kinds of cognitive stuff that goes on. So the first is, this is going to, this could be a whole lecture in and of itself. So this gets more complicated probably than we have time for, but I'll give it a shot. So if we look at trauma, a key aspect of trauma is something called coercive control. And what coercive control means is that you grow up in an environment where you don't get to control things. Someone else is controlling stuff for you. So, for example, I can make plans with my friends and I can say, hey, do you all want to come over for a sleepover this weekend? But then if I have like a very controlling parent, you know, I made these plans, I asked for permission, but my parent is pissed that day. So they force me to cancel the plans. They always control my life. They don't let me exert control. And in the worst cases, when I try to exert control, they will punish me for it. So they take away my control. So if you grow up, if your brain grows up in an environment without control, without agency, there is no point in planning towards the future, right? Because every time I make plans for the future, someone takes away my control. So there's, there's no point in planning for the future. In fact, planning for the future becomes a source of pain because now I have these hopes. Now I have these expectations and my parent is never going to let me enjoy that. They're going to try to control. They're going to try to suppress. They're going to try to abuse, whatever. So then what happens is if we don't plan for the future, there is no point in focusing. So if we really, I know it sounds kind of weird, but I want you all to think about this. When do you need to focus? You need to focus for the future, not for the present. Let's just come up with a thousand examples. Why do I need to focus on studying? Because I have a test on Friday. Why do I need to pay attention in class? Because I have a test on Friday. Why do I need to 
pay attention in this meeting at work so that I can get promoted, so I can advance. So our, our desire to rein in our impulses in focus is always future focused. It's for some benefit in the future. If it was fun in the present, then I wouldn't have to pull myself in, right? It's easy to focus on a video game because a video game has nothing to do with the future. In fact, it sabotages the future. But the second that someone with trauma tries to focus on something that benefits them in the future, their brain just rebels. And why does it rebel? It's because that part of the brain has become atrophied. Because we learned a long time ago that sacrificing today for tomorrow is a waste of time. Because when I spent all of my chore money, I, I've saved up all of this money. And I bought this PlayStation and my drunk dad on Christmas morning, because I was playing PlayStation instead of came down and set the table, they walked upstairs, they picked up the PlayStation and they smashed it on the ground and broke it apart with a hammer. Why the fuck would I ever want to sacrifice anything today for tomorrow? And then I have to study for a test when I'm 22 years old because I've failed one year of college and I'm still a junior. And now I try to get my mind to focus and it doesn't want to because it learned a long time ago that it's a waste of time. Does this mean I have ADHD? Absolutely not. It just means that I have cognitive consequences of trauma. So there's a ton of overlap between ADHD and trauma. It can look the same, but this is what y'all need to understand about mental health or mental diagnoses. There are symptoms and there are etiologies. The etiology is the cause, and the symptom is what it looks like. And the problem is that we take a list of symptoms, and we are self-diagnosing. Because I have difficulty focusing, that means I have ADHD. And the biggest tragedy there is that the reason that 90% of people have difficulty focusing in today's environment is because we were never taught how to focus. Focus is literally a skill of the mind that is trained in ancient India. They used to send students to this place called, I think, a Vidya Pit. They used to send them to the monastery where they were trained by monks to focus. So they learned about mathematics and literature and medicine. And they also learned, so medicine was a core part of the curriculum, by the way, just like history or math, as was focusing class where they teach you how to learn. What is the mechanism of memory? How do you optimize memory? It's crazy that we don't teach this stuff. And so just because you have difficulty focusing doesn't mean that you have ADHD. It could be trauma. It could be substance related. And it could be that you just never learned. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So, uh, by the way, so we're going to uh, talk about a lot of this stuff today. But if y'all are interested in more info, two things. One is that we've got a guide to ADHD and doing stuff, which hopefully will teach y'all, like, the mechanism through which the mind does things. Like, so how do you actually get yourself to do stuff? We try to break that down. Okay? And then we've got several videos on ADHD on our YouTube channel. So y'all can watch all those There's stuff about ADHD and depression and all that kind of stuff. We're going to cover a lot of it today. And the last thing is if y'all want more content on this that's like deep dive, let us know in some way. So we'll do more deep dive content on stream and stuff like that if y'all ask for it. But the, the, the fastest way to get it is to become a member and vote for it. So y'all decide what we, what we build content on as members. Okay. Okay, well, so someone's asking a question. What would it look like if someone had ADHD and suffered trauma in the past? It would look like ADHD. And so here's the crazy thing. So, that, so someone did a study. So we have a, a, a whole vi YouTube video about this, okay, about ADHD and depression. We also go into it in the guide, but the, the YouTube video is pretty in-depth. So growing up with ADHD means growing up with trauma in at least 70% of cases. So this is confusing for a lot of people. What does that mean? What do you mean? So when you are a child with ADHD, 
and you grow up in a neurotypical society, you are traumatized. Because your, your brain doesn't work the way that everybody else's does. So, for example, there's some studies that show that by the second grade, a child with ADHD will get invited to a total of zero birthday parties. Because when you're at the playground and you're a first grader, you don't wait for your turn in line. You go down the slide, there's a line of four kids, and you cut right to the front, and then you bowl someone out of the way, and then you climb up and you go down again. The other kids don't like you because you're impulsive. You don't understand that you even did anything wrong. You don't even see the other kids. You're like, that was fun. Let's do it again. But the other kids see that, and then they don't invite you to birthday parties. And then what comes, what ends up happening is you don't get invited to the birthday party. You don't get invited to any. And then Monday morning rolls around, and all the kids are talking about, wow, it was so much fun having, I had so much fun at your birthday party, and you are left out. Boom. Isolated. No friends. Traumatized. So if you look at a comorbid population of people who have ADHD and a mood disorder, like major depressive disorder, 3% of people who have depression will grow up to have ADHD. 70% of people who have ADHD first will grow up to have depression. There is a very clear causative link between growing up with ADHD and having self-esteem problems in the future. And the reason for that, I'll give you all just another reason. Because you know if you're ADHD that your intellect is good. You know you're not stupider than the other kids. But for some reason, you cannot do what the other kids do. You know that you're just as smart as your friend, but your friend gets an A and you get an F. And then you don't know what's wrong with you, but there must be something wrong with you. Something really bad because you can do it sometimes. You've been able to do it before. You've gotten an A on a test. There are times where you've been able to sit down and study and you've done awesome, but why can't you do it again? All you want is to do it again, but you can't. And as you don't understand that, you start to have self-esteem problems because what's wrong? If you're just as smart as they are, then you must have some kind of horrible debuff or some terrible character trait that just makes you randomly 50% chance that if you make a successful skill check, you fail anyway. You feel cursed. And this carries with you in your self-esteem because I'm fundamentally busted in some way because I'm just as smart as everybody else, but I can't do what other people do. So I must be busted. I just need to pay attention more. Very good. People will say things like that. Or if he or she applied themselves, if they actually tried, they could do so much better. You'll hear these kinds of statements like that. And so then what does a child believe? A child believes, oh, I'm someone who's lazy. I'm someone who doesn't try. When the truth of the matter is that you actually try 10 times as hard. But then what happens is you start to form an identity. I'm a lazy kid with ADHD. You don't think about ADHD. You diagnose yourself with laziness. That becomes a part of who you are. And then here's the really damning thing. Once you have an identity of being lazy, as you try to go and do things, your mind tells you, oh, you can't do that because you're a lazy person. Going to the gym is for people who aren't lazy, but you are lazy. Therefore, you're not going to succeed at the gym. And so there's a thousand different things that you could do in life, which your mind tells you you will fail at because you are lazy. So this is the tricky thing that a lot of people don't understand. People think that your future is determined by who you are. The truth of the matter is who you are. Uh, sorry. People think that what you do is determined by who you are, right? If I'm a lazy person, it will determine what I do or don't do. The truth is it's the other way around. What you do determines who you are. We get that mixed up and it's devastating because we let our idea of ourselves define what we're capable of. I'm unathletic. I'm lazy. I'm not graceful. I don't know how to dance. I don't know how to sing. That's not for me. And so then you never try. And then that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the more self-fulfilling of a prophecy it becomes, the more you believe it. Clearly, you're right, right? Because that one time that you were forced into karaoke, you did such a bad job. Holy shit, you're so bad at singing.
It is not who you are that determines what you do. It is what you do that determines who you are. It's actually all in your control. And this is the real tragedy of life. Is that you can fix it. But you have taught yourself or society has led you to believe that you are powerless. And this is what we've learned scientifically when we work with patients with trauma. The real tragedy of trauma is that when someone is in an abusive relationship, they have a lot more power than they realize. The reason they stay in an abusive relationship is because they have been taught to believe that they have no power. And when you give up your own power in a relationship, that's when you lose control of the relationship. When you give up your own agency in life, when you say that, oh, the world is a terrible place and I am unhappy because of inflation or climate change or political discourse or war, right? I'm not saying that those problems aren't real. They're absolutely real and they control huge aspects of our lives. So we can't do anything about that, right? Naturally. But the moment we say there is nothing I can do, we are surrendering what little power we have. We are surrendering what little control we have. And that's the real tragedy is you don't know exactly what you're capable of until you actually try. Okay. <laughs> okay. So people are asking, okay, what do you do about it? All right, so I'm going to ask y'all, do we have mods in chat? Can we do a quick poll? So I want to ask y'all, let me just look at, okay, we've got time. Um, so here's what I want to know. Do you guys want to answer questions from chat or do y'all want to go over the various posts that we've got? What's a better use of our time? If there are mods around. Mods may not be around. We'll see. I don't know how to do this stuff on, on YouTube. So someone's... Oh my God, so hard. Posts. Okay, people want to do posts. Um, thank y'all very much for signing up for membership. Okay, everyone wants to do posts. Okay. Oh, thank you, mods. Y'all are the real heroes and heroines. Go over posts. Okay, everyone wants to go over posts. Okay, so if you guys have questions, um, one thing to keep in mind is that, so we know that people have questions. We try to answer some of them here, but y'all get to decide. So we have a special Q&A portion uh, for members. Like, so once a month, we're going to do like a stream or something like that, where we focus specifically on Q&A. Um, and, but people want to go over posts, so that's what we're going to do. Okay? So y'all decide. All right. Um, okay, so this one, let's look at... Okay. I feel like... Some of the stuff we kind of covered. So it's emotional dysregulation. Okay. Let's talk about authority. Are problems with authority an ADHD thing? TLDR is in the title. Read on for details. Since I was a kid, I've always struggled with authority. It's mostly when someone in a position of authority, teacher, boss, etc., makes me do stuff that I don't find reasonable or fair. And I'm wondering if this is an ADHD thing. The only example I can think of right now is my third grade teacher trying to make me learn cursive handwriting, which I refused because regular handwriting was doing the job just fine, and I didn't see the need. Turned into a big argument, and I got in trouble. As an adult, the arguments are rare, and I just bottle up my anger inside. But it's still a problem because it makes me hate my boss and causes me to act rebellious. Do you guys also ha uh, experience this, and do you have any advice to make oneself care less about it? Great question. So do people with ADHD have a problem with authority? So from the get-go, the first thing we're going to say, 
we're going to remi rem remind ourselves that problems with authority have a differential diagnosis. So there are many things that give us a problem with authority. So for example, having a narcissistic personality will give you problems with authority. Having some different kinds of, uh, so let's call them, um, what is it? Oppositional, defiant disorder can result in problems with authority. Okay? There are all kinds of things that can result in problems with authority, including ADHD. So let's understand how ADHD leads to problems with authority. So the first reason that ADHD leads to problems with authority is because ADHD leads to emotional regulation deficits. So people with ADHD, so let's just take a quick look at this. Okay. So emotional lability, which means experiencing a lot of powerful emotions, can result from different neurobiological mechanisms. Um, we go into all this kind of stuff, but basically what, what happens is um, if you are a kid with ADHD, you will have difficulty regulating your emotions. Your frontal lobes, which are your control circuits of the brain, have difficulty inhibiting your emotions. So kids with ADHD will feel more emotions more rapidly so the onset of emotion is quick and less ability to control them. So now let's think about what this what, what this does when we have a situation with authority. So if it's easier for me to get pissed and it's harder for me to control my anger, the likelihood that I will talk back to my teacher or parents increases. Right? Because I get angry. And then anyone who gets angry and talks back is going to have problems with that authority figure. The problem is that that happens way more with kids with ADHD, which in turn then means that the kid with ADHD starts to get a reputation. This little shit, this little defiant little prick, this little kid who doesn't listen, this kid throws temper tantrums, this is a bad kid. And if you get a kid who's disobedient, and gets angry all the time, what are you going to do as an authority figure? You're going to clamp down. Exert your authority more. This person gets fewer passes. This disobedience needs to be worked out of them. Other kids get second chances, but this little shit? Hell no. We can't give this kid an inch. He'll take a mile. So this is source number one for problems of authority. But it gets worse. So source number two of problems with authority especially in school settings, is that ADHD kids are class clowns. So we have to understand this. When you're an ADHD kid, you have difficulty forming relationships. Why do you have difficulty forming relationships? Number one, you don't know how to pay attention. You can't pay attention. So if I'm having a conversation with a friend of mine and I'm zoning in and out, like, I can't participate in the conversation. And then the friend is going to be like, doesn't enjoy talking to me because I'm not paying attention. Or what happens is when I'm in a group of kids, I'm impulsive. And I interrupt people when they're talking. So why would anyone want to talk to me? So, like, this is all going to lead to social isolation. Last thing is when I'm on the playground or I'm playing a board game with someone, I'm not paying attention to the rules. I cut in line because I'm impulsive. And this is where we get back to kids with ADHD. Some studies show that they get invited to zero birthday parties by the second grade. Right? Why is that? It's because I keep cutting in line. I don't wait my turn. It's hard to play a board game with me so kids don't like me. So this leads to social isolation. So now I've got no friends. No one likes me. I get made fun of a lot. I have a low social ranking. How do I fix that? By being a class clown. Because no one wants to play with me. But 
when the teacher calls on me and says, little Alok, what is six plus seven? And I say, poo, poo, pee, pee. And everyone laughs. I don't even know what the fucking question was. So I couldn't answer it if I wanted to. So I'm screwed. I'm not going to know the right answer. So what do I do? I just say, poo, poo, pee, pee, poo, poo, pee, pee, poo, poo, pee, pee. And then the teacher gets mad at me, but everybody else starts laughing. And suddenly my social isolation has improved. Increase in social standing. So as I form defiance to the teacher, all the other kids like it. And it's not like I'm going to know the answer anyway. So this is the second reason why ADHD kids are defiant to authority. We'll compromise our relationship with our teacher, which is pretty bad to begin with. And at least the other kids will like me. This is also why people with ADHD make really good streamers, because we're hilarious. Because we don't know what the hell is going on. We can look at two comments from chat, and we can make some stupid-ass joke. It makes us very effective at streaming, because we know how to be spontaneously funny. Okay? Uh, reason number three. Oh, yeah. So, oh. Reason number three. Now, this is the one that is really hard to understand for young kids. So let's take a look at this example. The only example I can think of right now is my third grade teacher trying to make me learn cursive handwriting, which I refused because regular handwriting was doing the job just fine, and I didn't see the need. This is sort of an incorrect interpretation. So I want you all to think about the mind of a third grader, right? This is an eight-year-old kid. When an eight-year-old kid says, I don't want to do something, they don't use logic. I refused because regular handwriting. No, they're not like doing a logical analysis and then they decide, oh my God, like this is not a good use of my time. Therefore, I respectfully disagree with the fact that I need to learn this. Therefore, I'm not going to learn cursive. That's not actually what happens. You make logical arguments once you, once you have a fully developed brain. A third grader doesn't know how to make a logical argument. They come up with some rationale, but that's not how their mind works. This is emotional. So what happens with a third grader with ADHD is they look at learning cursive and they think this is hard. I'm not going to be able to do this. This is boring. I'm going to fail. This makes me angry. There's no way I'm going to learn this shit. That's really what the third grader is thinking. Because they've learned by this point in the third grade that they can't focus on stuff, right? They already know they have an impairment. And anytime we ask an, a kid with ADHD to learn cursive, they realize subconsciously, I'm going to fail at this. That makes them very angry and very ashamed. So how can I avoid failure? When I know I can't focus, I can't, my hand doesn't write this way. I don't know how to do this. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to fail no matter what. So what they choose to do is not play the game. They say, fuck you. I'm not going to do this. And this creates problems with authority. So people with ADHD create problems with authority when they subconsciously know they're going to fail at a task. And so it's very common for people with ADHD to have problems with authority, but we have to understand why these problems happen. There's a fundamental difficulty with emotional regulation, which means that authority doesn't like us. The second thing is we learn that as we become socially isolated, one way to rally the people is in defiance of authority. So I learned very early on that the only way the other kids will like me is if I say, fuck you to the teacher, because then everybody laughs and I go to detention. And the third thing is that in a neurotypical world, authority tells me to do something that I know I'm going to fail. And no third grader, let alone 30 year old, is going to willingly sign up for a task that they know they're going to fail. Right? You don't do that. You don't like sign up for Olympic swimming tryouts knowing that you're going to get crushed. You don't go compete at, you don't try out to be a cheerleader for the Dallas Cowboys knowing you're going to get crushed. We do things that we think we can succeed at. And if we think we can, we're going to fail at something, we try to bow out. 
But as a third grader, you don't know how to do that in a healthy way. You don't know how to tell the, you don't even, you're not even aware. You can't say to the teacher, hey, I, I feel like I'm afraid that I'm going to fail at this. And I'm afraid that all the other kids are going to make fun of me because I'm not going to be able to focus my mind and learn cursive. Therefore, can you please help me? The third grader doesn't have the awareness of that. So they say, no, I'm not going to do it. They know instinctively that they're going to fail and they just rebel the way that they know how, which gets perceived as a problem with authority. But even if you have all of these things, I don't want y'all to think everyone with a problem with authority has ADHD because there are many reasons that people have, uh, have problems with authority. Another thing that we didn't consider on the differential diagnosis is I have parents who are powerful. This creates problems with authority all the time. Because when I go toe to toe, toe with the teacher, the teacher says, you failed this class. And then mommy and daddy show up and they, they threaten to sue the principal. Principal goes to teacher and says, give him a B. And then teacher comes and says, you get a B. And then the kid is like, great. I'm glad you learned your lesson, bitch. Next time, you better give me an A. So there are all kinds of reasons that lead to a problem with authority. But it can absolutely happen consistently with ADHD. Okay. Next. All right. Um... see which one do we want to do okay let's do this one is starting over several times in your life an adhd thing i just got diagnosed in my 30s and throughout my life i've lost contact with 98 percent of my friends due to moving around and switching between different jobs and focus areas i went to high school in another city lost contact with most of my primary school friends i joined the army lost contact with most of my high school friends i went to university lost contact with most of my army buddies i moved to a different city for work and lost contact with most of my university friends and so it has continued it is not just losing friends but i also feel like i have taken on whole new personalities when i switched settings i've done a lot of thinking into this in the past and luckily my so has kept me grounded for the past decade but i cannot help but wonder whether this was actually an adhd thing all along Okay. Um, thank you all so, so much for your comments. It is overwhelming to see how many people relate to this. The relationship between wanderlust gene and ADHD plus ADHD masking seem to explain a lot of a lot, and I will definitely be looking more into that. So the first thing to understand is that just because something happens in ADHD does not mean that if that thing happens, you have ADHD. Right. So people with ADHD may start over a lot, but just because you start over a lot does not mean that you necessarily have ADHD. There's a differential diagnosis. So another good example of this is the wanderlust gene. Right. So whatever they're talking about here. But this is what I mean. So some people just have this wanderlust gene and they just move on from place to place. I'm like that. OK, so let's just talk about personality versus ADHD. So this is where I personally like the Ayurvedic conception, I find it to be very helpful. So Ayurveda is traditional Indian medicine. And Ayurveda posits, is different from Western medicine for a couple of reasons. The first major reason that it's fundamentally different is that it assumes that not all people are the same. So I know it sounds weird, but doesn't Western medicine assume that people are different? No, right? So if like, if I diagnose you with ADHD, you have ADHD. And other people who have ADHD or we all have ADHD. And so there are set criteria for ADHD. It is not that ADHD is individual in a person. There is an isolated disease process, which has an isolated treatment, and the person is doesn't factor in. So I know it sounds kind of weird, but let's take a look at the way that Western science studies things. Okay? So we use these things called randomized controlled trials. And what randomized controlled trials mean is that we try to remove the individuality from the trial. We try to take populations that have 50% men and 50% women, old people, young people. We try to remove all individuality. That's what the controlled is. We try to control for all individual factors so that we can isolate the disease process and the treatment in removing individuality from the equation. That's literally how we do things. We remove individuality. 
So when we ask, okay, what are the diet recommendations that Western science recommends? It is the same recommendations for everybody, right? 2,000 calories a day, high fiber, low sugar, medium amount of protein, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. Everyone should eat the same things. Whereas in Ayurveda, they say different people, depending on your constitution, should be eating different things. So they believe that people are different. Now, this is where I like the Ayurvedic conception of something called vata. So there are some people who have a personality that is vata. And vata is made up of two elements, wind and ether. We're going to gloss over ether for now. But vata people are like the wind. And what does that mean? So if you look at the wind, the wind is cold. It's dry. It's strong. It's inconsistent. It blows really hard in one direction, and then it dies down. And then it blows really hard in another direction, and then that stops. And now we're blowing over here, and now we're blowing over here, and now we're blowing over here. That is different from someone who has a personality like fire, which is another one of the doshas. So fire is steady, stable, in one direction. If a fire starts on this end of the forest, there's only one direction it's going to go, right? It doesn't randomly decide to change directions or stop or die down or anything like that. We're starting in one direction. And we're going to plow forward in that direction. So when I was struggling in life, so just to give you all an example, my freshman year of college, I ran for student government. I joined a fundraising organization. I joined a fraternity. I joined a, like a science council. Like I did all this random crap. I joined like a cultural organization. So I did like a thousand different things because I was like so excited and I want to do a bunch of random stuff because my mind is like the wind. I get excited about this, I move in this direction. I get excited about this, I move in this direction. Even if you look at my life today, well, we'll get to that in a second. So then what happened is my dad told me, hey, Alok, you're failing all your classes. Oh, I also signed up for Japanese, Spanish, philosophy, and science classes, and I was pre-med, and I just took a bunch of random classes. And so I failed basically all my classes my first year. My dad tells me, hey, you're trying to do too many different things. You need to focus on one thing, right? You're too distracted. You're doing like a thousand different things. Just do fewer things. And so I said, okay, dad, you're right. So then I cut down the things that I had cut out all the extracurriculars, still failed a lot. My second semester of my sophomore year, I even cut down to half a normal class load. I'm still doing too much, still failed a lot. So then I went to India. And someone there listened to the story and they started laughing, an Ayurvedic doctor. And they said, that is a terrible idea. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, what was your experience as you started cutting things out? Did it become easier to do the remaining things? And I was like, no. So even when you were taking two classes instead of a normal load of five, could you focus? No, I couldn't focus. Why not? Well, I got bored. I got bored very easily. And he's like, yes, that's correct. So he said, your mind is like the wind and it'll get bored very easily. So what you need to do is find the right balance of as many different things that you can do. So imagine you're juggling a few balls and try to juggle as many balls as you can without dropping a single one. So you need variety in your day. You need to be trying to do as many different things as you can without screwing up. So don't overdo it, which is what I did at the very beginning. But recognize that variety is actually getting, that novelty will get keep you excited. If you do the same thing over and over and over again, you're going to get bored. This is the vata mind. And once I got this piece of advice, it changed the way that I lived my life. So now, for example, I see patients for five to 10 hours a week. I stream and make content for some hours a week. I wrote a book. I go and I give talks. I do workshops. I go and am a guest on podcasts. So I find that the more variety I have in my life, the more I excel at each of those things. Whereas there are other people who are like kind of like the fire, right? Their personality is like, I'm going to do one thing and I'm going to go in one direction. I get bored. So this wanderlust gene or this aspect of starting over, over, and over and again is a feature of ADHD or the Vata personality. And Vata and ADHD are highly correlated. Okay? It's just a different conception. And so oftentimes what we will do is start over. And I did the same thing. I had a group of friends in high school. I went to college, left them behind. 
graduated college, moved to Boston, started med school, make a brand new set of friends, go to residency, make a brand new set of friends, leave residency. Now I'm back where I grew up and now I'm making a new set of friends. This is very normal if you have Vata, if this is your personality, because you enjoy variety. It doesn't mean that you've necessarily got ADHD. This is just a personality thing. Now, the, the reason that it correlates with ADHD is people who have high Vata have, are very close to having ADHD, and there's an overlap between high Vata and ADHD. But I would say that if you start things over, over and over and over again, that's very normal. There's nothing wrong with it. Now, the real question becomes... How do I make progress if I get bored easily and I switch what I want to do? So this is where I have one really interesting trick, which is that I find that when I get bored of something, I can set it down. But then if I come back to it later, I will be just as interested. So the biggest problem that people with, with high Vata make, so if you're someone who's got ADHD, quote unquote, is, so how can you become consistently good at something? if you get bored very easily, okay? So let's take a look at this. So here's what we have. We have ADHD, or call it the wanderlust gene, or Vata, okay? I'm kind of using these three terms interchangeably. So here's what happens. I start with thing number one, and then I get bored of that, and I go to thing number two, and then I get bored of that, and I go to thing number three, I get bored of that, go to thing number four, get bored of that, thing number five, get bored of that, thing number six. So here's the trick. By the time you finish thing number three, if you actually go back and you redo one, you'll be just as interested. So then we're going to get better at one. And by the time I'm done with one, I'm going to go back to two. And this will be interesting again. And then I'm going to go back to three. And this will be interesting again. And then I'm going to go back to one. And I'm going to go to two. And I'm going to go to three. So this is the difference between what happens in the standard case, which is that we just get one check here, one check here, one check here. And we go, we do something else. So you end up digging a thousand wells that are one foot deep. Now, here's the crazy thing. The cool thing is that if you do this, you will actually outperform the people who are slow and steady wins the race because you have more total energy. Your excitement is worth so much. So if you have this wanderlust gene or ADHD, you can accomplish what takes other people a week. You can do it in one day if your excitement is at the right level. So what I encourage you all to do is harness that excitement. And then people may wonder, Dr. K, how are you able to do so much? I see patients. I make content. I write books. I go on podcasts. I do all this stuff, right? I'm a streamer. I was faculty at Harvard Medical School. They're like, man, bro, you must be OP. No, I'm just as degenerate as the rest of you. I'm not actually any better than anyone. I just know how to play this game. I figured out how I work. And now I get super excited about something else. And then I harness that excitement. This is the key thing. Don't go to thing number four, thing number five, thing number six. Circle back around. Circle back around. You want to learn how to play guitar? Fantastic. Buy a guitar. You get bored of it? No problem. You want to learn how to paint? Get painting stuff. No problem. You get bored of painting and you want to learn how to garden? No problem. But when you get bored of gardening, don't pick up the piano. Go back to guitar. And then what you'll find is that, you know, you, you guys know what I'm talking about? Where you sort of do this thing where, like, you accomplish so much in one day. And you ask yourself all the time, why can't I do this all the time? Shit, man. If I could, I had such an awesome day yesterday. I did so much. And you go chasing those days of maximum superhuman productivity that your normie friends who are succeeding at life can't even imagine. And you have 10 shitty days and you have one beautiful day. And somehow you're still surviving because one day of functionality counts as like five for a regular human being. And you wonder to yourself, if I could do this every day, imagine what I accomplish. This is how you do it every day. Every day you knock it out of the park. Because you learn how to harness that excitement, harness that novelty, harness that wanderlust. And then every day, I mean, I work usually six to seven days a week, and I work like 60 to 80 hours a week, and I don't feel tired because everything that I'm doing is very exciting. And people will say stuff like, oh, love what you do, and you'll never work one day in your life. Now, the problem is that most of the people who do that 
love one thing, and that's what they fill their life up in. And the problem with us who get bored easily is that we love lots of things, and we don't know how to duplicate that formula. This is how you duplicate it. Every day, you're excited. Every day, it's new for you. We want to create novelty, but we also want to create depth. So use this cycle, and you can wanderlust all you want, and yet you'll still be consistent. You'll still build things. Avoid burnout? Yeah, it's not an issue. When you're doing something that you enjoy, when you get, because think about it, right? So when you, you do like eight hours of something a day because you get super excited, you're not burnt out at the end of it. You may be delightfully spent. Burnout doesn't happen for people with ADHD because they're working hard every day at a new thing that they're excited about. Burnout happens when you do a shitty job at the same thing over and over and over again, and it takes you spend 10 hours of effort to do two hours of work. That's what burns you out. It's not chasing your excitement. It's ignoring your excitement and doing the same rote, damn, boring thing over and over and over again. That's what burns people out. Two hours of productive work that takes 10 hours will burn out someone with ADHD. Not doing 10 hours of exciting work every single day. The formula for burnout is individual. This is the beauty of Ayurveda. Whereas if you look at all of the studies on burnout, they'll say that burnout is the same for all people. It's not. Right? We know it's not because the stuff that burns you out, you look at your friend who's able to do that every day and they're crushing it and they're not burning out. But if you try to do 20% of what they do, you'd be burnt out. So understand yourself. Set up a life that harnesses who you are. Don't try to become someone else. That's such an uphill battle. Why don't you just be the best version of yourself and create a life that fits you? Then you're off to the races and you're still going to be lazy. Because when you get excited, you're just doing something productive. Questions? Okay, so there's a question. So people are asking, can you do a variety in one thing? Sure, right? So this is where you decide. You're asking me, how the fuck do I know what's going to work for you? So you tell me, can you do a variety in one thing? Can you change which characters you play in Dota and make it fun for a long time? Or do you need to play different video games? I don't know. You all decide. How do you do this as a student? Very good question. So a lot of times we think that as students, variety comes from the classes we take. But it's still all education. So I'd say the main thing to do as a student is to try to do a couple of things outside of school, right? So if you're a student don't, and you want to write fiction, like start writing fiction. I'm going to do my work, my school work, and then some days I'm going to write fiction. Or I'm going to learn how to garden. Or I'm going to go do something physical. I'm going to go rock climbing. Or I'm going to travel. Or I'm going to volunteer. Or whatever. So don't do things just to pad your resume. Do things that excite you. Do things that give you a break from the monotony of school. And all you need to do is find that balance to where you're not taking so many breaks that the school actually suffers. So this is the key thing. Juggle as many balls as you can without dropping a single one. I'd start with honestly four activities, four different things in your life. That's kind of where the sweet spot is usually for me. Three seems a little bit too little. So, like, you need variety. So, I, I find that four things is good. So, does this a type, uh, apply to inattentive type to ADHD? Absolutely. So, the whole point of inattentive type of ADHD is we want to do things that garner our attention. It works really well for inattentive type. Because the whole point is when you're excited about something, your attention naturally comes. People with inattentive type from ADHD aren't inattentive in all situations. In fact, they can hyper-focus half the time, not half the time, 10% of the time. So what we're doing is we're farming for hyper-focus. And the whole point is that the reason you're inattentive is because you do the same crap over and over and over again, which is why your mind gets bored and you become increasingly inattentive. What this methodology does is it allows you to bypass the inattention. 
It creates attention instead of inattention. You are neither attentive nor inattentive. There is, an, there is an interaction between you and the environment. And every human being on the planet does not respond to the same level of attention given the same stimulus. Right? So like some people may think like, oh my God, like some beautiful woman in lots of lingerie just walked in and now 100% of my attention is on this beautiful woman. Assuming I'm a man. But if I'm gay, my attention is going to be different. If I'm a homosexual woman, then it'll be the same as a heterosexual man. Right? So the attention that you bring to the table depends on who you are. Okay? Is maladaptive daydreaming related to ADHD? Probably. We have a whole lecture on maladaptive daydreaming. Y'all should definitely check it out. Okay? And if you guys want, like, more stuff on this, just let us know. You guys pick the topic. So that's one of the things that we're doing with memberships now. Members are going to vote in four days about which four in-depth topics I prepare for next month. So these are, for 10 bucks a month, we're doing four lectures plus Q&A on topics of members' choice. We're also doing our standard level of content. So memberships does not reduce the amount of free content that we make. I'm planning a deep dive, probably something around women's mental health and um, asexuality are probably coming up, hopefully in January. Okay. Love these questions. But people said posts, right? So we're going to do posts. Okay. Um, okay, let's do uh, let's do this one. Women with ADHD. Does your executive function slash depressive symptoms get even worse during your period? When I consider all the things I'm contending with, my life feels irreparably broken. The thing is, even though I do feel that from time to time, it's always way worse during my period. I've read that symptoms of ADHD get worse during menopause, but does anyone know if that's also true during a normal menstrual cycle? Does your executive function slash depressive symptoms get worse around that time? It's a great question. So in order to answer it, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, I got to find this. Okay, this. How do I? Um, okay. Hold on a second, chat. I got a. Mm, let's do new image. Oh boy. Ugh. Hold on a second, chat. I got to figure this out. I want to download. How do I? Because I need to draw on an image. So I'm trying to figure out, I have an app. Let's try this, import. Oh boy. Give me a second, chat. I'm trying to figure out how do I download original file? No. How do I download a file on an iPad? It's fucking ridiculous. 
Okay. No. Okay, we're gonna have to draw the. Let's try copying this link. See if that works. Home. Copy. Then let's try this. Oh boy. Okay, I don't know. Okay. We're gonna have to draw it then, chat. Good God. GG noobs. Okay. Yeah, screen. Uh, well, the problem is I'm trying to just download a file from download. Download plain. This is so weird. Okay, hold on a second. We're gonna have to do it a different way. I really want to do this. You, can can y'all bear with me for a second? Okay, let's try this. Oh my god. <laughs> I love how I see ads on my own channel. It's brilliant. Um, okay. Okay, now let's see if I can pull it up this way. Almost, almost there, chat. Almost there. Okay, random stream stuff. Download. Yes. How the fuck? How do you just... Dude, this... Apple is driving me crazy. This is insane. How do you just download something? Make available offline. No, that's... I don't... I want to open it in a different thing. Open in. Let's try this. My God. Why can't you just right click? Oh, here we go. Save to files. Let's just save it. On my iPad. Save. Okay. Dude, I swear, it's like not being able to use like a file structure and just like download something and like open it instead doing all this app specific crap. No, I don't want to access photos. I just want to look at my download directory. Import. There we go. Select. No, not select all. Not five items, one item, one item, open. Does it work? There we go, hallelujah. Whoa, can we just get a, just, I just want to, now can I write on this? Beautiful. Okay. Okay. Now we're talking. That is so much harder than it needs to be. Okay. All right. So let's do this. Mm. I don't even know what y'all are doing. Like, this is nuts, man. The skill check to just 
download a file and open it in a program is absurd. It's like, it's so like, I, okay, let's get back to the question at hand. So women with ADHD, does your executive dysfunction slash depressive symptoms get worse during your period? The answer is yes. So here's the problem with ADHD and menstruation, okay? So ADHD absolutely affects menstruation, but things are way worse than we... Th this is a real mess. So if we look at medicine, we've made a critical mistake in medicine. And this mistake has has been, been is huge for women. So the biggest mistake that we made in medicine is that we assume that the disease process is the same all 30 days. So if we look at something like heart disease, it is not a dimension of heart disease that it gets worse on Tuesday and better next Thursday. It is sort of a fixed problem. So if we look at our models of disease, we do not account for a hormonal fluctuation impacting the disease. This is, I think, a, a very important bias in medicine because in half the population, their disease process gets altered based on menstrual cycles. And the fact that this is not a key part of our understanding of medicine is a huge oversight. So let's take a look at the impact of menstruation on ADHD. So here's a paper that talks about reproductive steroids and ADHD symptoms across the menstrual cycle. Okay, so we'll go into more detail in a second. The relationship between sex hormones, reproductive stages, and ADHD, a systematic review, where we see that, you know, there's different kinds of data that we'll, we'll dive into what this is. Attention deficit disorder in the menstrual cycle, theory and evidence, where we talk about, for example, there are declines in executive function and trait control characterized by increases in approach and risk be behaviors at mid-cycle periovulation and increases in avoidance and negative affect perimenstrually. Okay, so we'll explain what all this is. I'll, I'll break it down for y'all. But the short answer is that ADHD is absolutely affected by your menstrual cycle, and it's not even like it makes it worse. That is a simplistic view. As it turns out, if we really look at the menstrual cycle, what we discover is that the various features of ADHD are actually change throughout the menstrual cycle. So some things get worse, some things get better. This thing changes this way, this thing changes that way. There's like all kinds of variations. So let's go through what happens, all right? So let's start by understanding the female menstrual cycle. And I know this is kind of scary for y'all, but let's understand it. So the first thing to understand about the female menstrual cycle is that it starts with menses. So menstruation, or when you get your period, is actually day zero or day one. Okay, that's how we sort of rank things. And then after menstruation, we enter something called the uh, proliferative phase, and then we sort of get ready to ovulate. So this is like where the, the egg is out, and then we're developing a follicle, and then during ovulation, the follicle ejects an egg. And this egg is capable of getting pregnant. Okay, and then if it gets pregnant, then it sort of implants in the uterus over here. It implants over here in the uterus, and then we get a pregnancy. And if there's no implantation that happens, we wind back around to menses, and we repeat the cycle again. Okay, so now let's understand how ADHD affects these things. Now, the main way that ADHD gets affected is actually by these hormones. And different hormones do different things at different levels. So it's not so simple as ADHD gets worse during this phase and better during this phase. ADHD has a number of different features like emotional regulation, risk-taking behavior, impulsivity, mood, and all of these get uniquely affected by the balance of hormones. So the first thing is that when we look at periods of time, that estradiol, uh, okay, so when estradiol is low and progesterone is high, so this is the phase that we're talking about, this leads to increased impulsivity. 
So what we sort of know is that the we just know from different studies that one of the changes that we see in menstruation is that in your secretory phase, which is immediately after ovulation, something about the balance of your estrogen and progesterone level lead to a worsening of impulsivity. Oh, God. Okay, so that's change number one. Change number two. Oh, God. Okay, there we go. Is we know that so this is kind of similar, but periovulation. So around the time of ovulation, we also get increased risk taking behavior. Okay? If we sort of think about this, right? This is very dangerous. Because if we think about like getting pregnant, right around the time that we are capable of getting pregnant from a menstrual standpoint, as when we as women, I'm using the collective we, but when y'all women, I suppose, have increased risk-taking behavior and increased impulsivity. So what is the relationship between the menstrual cycle and ADHD symptoms? Our capacity to gauge risk and think about the consequences of our actions seems to be affected by this progesterone to estrogen level. So when our estrogen is lower than our progesterone, we're more, we become riskier. So what I would advise to women when it comes to ADHD in the menstrual cycle is prepare for more impulsive behavior periovulation. So what this kind of means is that if you have a regular menstrual cycle, 14 days after you menstruate, you're going to enter the zone of high risk-taking behavior. So I would be extra careful who you have sex with. Be extra careful who you hang out with because it may be easier for you to have sex. You may not think about the consequences quite as much. And so you're going to have more impulsivity. All right? That's what the studies show anyway. Next thing is that perimenstrually, we see increases in avoidance and negative affect. So around the time of menstruation, so over here, we're going to see increased avoidance. an increased negative affect. Oh, that's negative. So these are the two big changes that we see that seem to be related to ADHD. So interestingly enough, it's not even attentional. So around the time of your menstrual cycle, if you have ADHD, you will be more vulnerable to negative emotions. And you are more likely to be avoidant. And this is the interesting thing is it's not that people who menstruate are more avoidant when they've got ADHD. There's a fluctuation that is dependent on hormones. So what do we need to take away from this? Let me actually look at one last thing. Um, okay. So the last thing to consider is that when we have low estrogen, I mean, uh, low progesterone, this seems to be correlated. So the, the purple one being low, this seems to be correlated with negative affect. Okay. L or low mood. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I want y'all to understand this is super cool. So as our progesterone, if low progesterone means low mood, what does high progesterone mean? It means high mood. And when our mood is really good, that's when we like to have a good time. That's when we become more impulsive. That's when we don't think about the negative consequences of our actions, right? Because we're feeling pretty good. We're feeling pretty chill. We don't have to worry about much. So it's all good, baby. And so this is what's really interesting. Is that when it comes to the menstrual cycle and ADHD, we don't see a whole lot of data that suggests that it is purely attentional. In fact, what we see is that the menstrual cycle interacts with the part of ADHD that is affected by hormones. And that seems to be more to do with risk-taking behavior, impulsivity, reactivity, and mood. So it's not so much that you have difficulty concentrating, which is also why it's so confusing for many people. That they're saying, well, I have, maybe I have some degree of difficulty concentrating, but it's not necessarily, it's not so simple as concentration. It's that I'm less able to control my impulses, apparently periovulation, so halfway through your menstrual cycle, 
right? right? And then your mood will probably be a little bit lower around the time of menstruation. You'll engage in more avoidant behaviors around the time of menstruation. And so as a woman, it's really important to understand these fluctuations because this is what you have to prepare for. My experience of working with women and, uh, who have ADHD during their menstrual cycles is it's really confusing. Like they don't know what to expect. Clearly there's some kind of correlation, but they're like, eh, it's not like I have difficulty studying, but sometimes this is harder and sometimes this is harder. So the couple things you need to watch out for, worsening affect, increased avoidance during your menstru menstruation. 14 days later during ovulation, your mood can improve. You'll become more impulsive and you'll take more risks. So be careful. Questions? Yeah, so 1984X is saying high progesterone is not good mood at all. Progesterone can cause inflammation, make you feel uh, like having a cold body temperature goes up. Absolutely true. So remember, what we're talking about here is not the effect of progesterone on mood. We're talking about the specific way in which progesterone affects the mood of people who are not neurotypical and have ADHD. And this is at least what the handful of studies that I've looked at so far show, is that there are changes in mood. What if you have irregular cycles? This is <laughs> great question. So remember that this is kind of why I explained, if we go back to this, hold on. So the reason that I didn't talk about just the cycle, but I talked about the hormonal imbalance or the hormonal effect is that even if you have irregular cycles, if this process sometimes takes 28 days and sometimes takes 35 days, the thing that affects the ADHD symptoms is not this down here or this down here, but this over here. So as you understand where you are in your cycle and the balance of your hormones, whether it takes 35 days, 28 days, or 21 days, those effects should be the same. So even if you don't know exactly what's going on, you kind of know that, okay, increased avoidance and negative affect is going to come first. And then in about two weeks, we can see a lifting of food, mood and an increase in impulsivity and an increase in risk-taking behavior. So even you can know that, okay, like right now I'm feeling down. I stopped feeling down. A week from now, maybe I'll start to feel good. And, uh, and that's when I need to be really careful about like my impulsivity. My impulsivity could get worse. So I need to be more careful about not impulsively buying things or at the last minute deciding to throw a party. This is where I tend to screw myself because I give it give in to my impulses. So irregular cycles is gets complicated, but that's exactly why we're not basing it on this or this. What we're basing it on is this. And these number, this stuff can change from person to person and week to week or month to month. Great question. Okay, this is great. So there are also questions about birth control pills and ADHD. So the first criminal mistake that the field of medicine has made is that we as a field, when we prescribe birth control, we don't tell people, hey, by the way, do you have ADHD? Because it could affect your ADHD. We'll mention mood a little bit. Oftentimes that's like a part of the, you know, anticipatory guidance when prescribing birth control. But this is kind of the, the, the I think the tragedy in medicine is that just about every aspect of your physiology and psychology is going to be affected by your hormonal levels. Now, this is less of an issue for men unless we've got low testosterone or something like that. And that's because our hormonal levels don't seem to fluctuate at the level that they do for women. But even we know, for example, that the risk of cancer and heart disease changes post-menopause. So all of those changes that are likely due to hormonal changes in women that are going to affect your heart health and your risk of cancer, all of those changes are going on from a week-to-week -week basis within you. So your, your, your cholesterol metabolism, your, you know, some of that stuff is aggregate risk over time, so it doesn't change that much, but there's all kinds of things that are changing week to week. And it's criminal in medicine that we haven't sort of acknowledged that, right? We don't educate women on that. When we start them on birth control, we don't say, hey, this could affect your ADHD. It could affect your anxiety. It could affect your mood. It could affect everything, your OCD. It could even affect the way that you feel about yourself and the way that you form relationships and attachments. 
So birth control is going to affect all of this stuff. The question of how depends on the birth control. So for example, we have some progesterone-only birth control. We have some mixed estrogen progesterone birth control. We have birth control that is pills that then has a placebo area that induces your menstruation. We also will have things like IUDs, which can also have progesterone in them, which have more of a local effect. So those I would expect to affect this stuff less. Right? So the, how does birth control affect your ADHD? It depends on the birth control. Great question, though. I wish I could say birth control does this. But the whole point is that like that would be an oversimplification, and that's not how it works. The mistake that we're making is we're assuming that there's one effect. No, it's like complicated. Yeah, NuvaRing is a good example of like, I think NuvaRing is progesterone only, right? <laughs> so Donnie G is saying, sounds like a smart <laughs> evolutionary move to ensure we procreate. Yeah, maybe, right? So maybe increasing risk-taking behavior around the time that you can get pregnant propagates the species. Dazios is asking, I've taken some sort of birth control since I was 16. Should I stop to see how I'm without the pill or keep going with Yaz because of my PMDD? That is a question for your doctor, right? And now we get to the beautiful part of stream. When we say everything is for educational and entertainment purposes only, this crosses the line. Right? So when we say this is not medical advice, if I were to say, hey, you should stop your birth control, that, in my opinion, would cross over. So we're teaching you all these general principles, and the whole point of stream is to, is, and it's not that I, it's that it would be irresponsible to cross that line, because I don't know what your medical history is. I don't know how long you've had PMDD. I don't know what your differential diagnosis is. So now that you all understand this stuff, by all means, go and talk to your doctor about it and ask them, hey, what do you think about me stopping my birth control, here are my considerations. And when someone knows your medical history, then they can actually provide medical care. They will ask you diagnostic questions and make treatment recommendations. Would you recommend an endocrinologist to track those hormonal phases? How can an endocrinologist help with ADHD? Here's what I would recommend. If y'all are interested in menstruation and ADHD in that particular intersection, See a psychiatrist who specializes in women's health. That would be my recommendation. Not an endocrinologist. OB-GYN would be number two. So number one would be psychiatrist who specializes in, in women's health. Number two would actually be an OB-GYN. Number three would be general psychiatrist. Maybe that's wrong. Or an OB-GYN who knows like mental health stuff. Because OBs can be really fantastic. They're like super hardworking and stuff. Does the high impulsivity phase amplify actions based on negative emotions? The short answer is we don't really know. But based on my reading of it, and I'll show you all the, the reference right here. So this is a relatively small study, but let's take a look. So the present study examined estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone associations with ADHD symptoms across the menstrual cycle in regularly cycling women with a sample size of 32. So this is a very small study. And what we find is that results indicated decreased levels of E2 in the context of increased levels of P4 or T were associated with higher ADHD symptoms the following day, particularly for those with high trait impulsivity. Okay? So that's number one. So this is where we become more impulsive. Now let's look at why. So increases... Um, in low in avoidance and negative affect perimenstrually, low estrogen and control may then interact with increases in positive and negative affect, respectively, to increase hyperactivity, impulsivity symptoms post ovulation and inattention. Oh, it looks like inattention symptoms perimenstrually. So what this kind of means is that we're not hundred percent sure because th this study is also not hundred percent because we don't really have great. And here's, if you guys want to know, <laughs> here's what we know. The l literature on the relationship between sex hormones and ADHD is limited. Available studies present contradicting information. 
it is not known. We, we don't know, really know much. So what I've done is I, I've taken essentially a lot of low quality research and tried to synthesize it into something as best as I can understand it. But it seems that, that low estrogen may then interact with increases in positive and negative affect. So this study is suggesting that there could be a vulnerability to both. That when we have low estrogen, we become more, more vulnerable to positive and negative affect, which in turn will result in impulsivity. Does that make sense? Someone's asking about a podcast with the men's ADHD support group. We've got a press inquiry thing on our website. Just apply there. That's how we handle that. Why not high quality research? Just because we don't have great studies yet, right? We're spending our money on other things. How does ADHD medicine interact with the menstrual cycle? What a great question. So ADHD medicine, to my knowledge, does not interact profoundly with the menstrual cycle. But actually, you know, I haven't done that search. So hold on a second. Let's find out together. Um... Okay, so let's just look. Here's how I answer questions, y'all. You guys want to do this with me? Let's do it together. So I, I did stimulant medication menstrual cycle, or we can do ADHD medication. Let's see. Mm, the pharma... Okay. No, but see, this isn't about menstruation. Let's see. Hmm... Um, Yeah, see, this is a study that's looking at, like, differences between boys and girls. It's not specifically about the the effect on the men menstrual cycle. So here, if we do stimulant medication, which is why I searched for stimulant medication. Um, let's take a look at this. See, this is a cross-sectional study. That's not going to help. This is a case report. Ah, here we go. This is what we want. Acute effects of D-amphetamine during the follicular and luteal phases. This is this paper. Net. Nah. Reject. Mm. Although there were no baseline differences in mood during the follicular or luteal phase, the effects of AMPH were greater during the follicular phase than the luteal phase. Okay. So the follicular phase is, so it seems that like the uh, the medication makes people feel better post menses. So the follicular phase is the part after menses. And the luteal phase is post ov ovulation. Um, so it looks like AMPH, so uh, amphetamines are influ the response to amphetamines is is dependent uh, depends on the level of estrogen right so it looks so so now now let's go back to this so now we learned something isn't this cool so so it looks like during this phase so let me change my color mm. Where's my color? Pen color. Let's do blue, green. Okay. So it looks like during this phase where our estrogen levels are high, this is when amphetamines or stimulants correlate with a bigger effect, according to this one study. So it's very possible that you have a differential response to medication based on where you are in your menstrual cycle, and it seems to correlate with the level of estrogen. So what we find is that people during the follicular phase, right? So this is the follicular phase. This is the first half. Feel more high energetic and intellectually efficient 
euphoric. Um, so during the luteal phase, in the presence of both estrogen and progesterone, estrogen levels were not related to the effect of AMPH, which means that the follicular phase, your medication will work differently. And in the luteal phase, it seems like there isn't a differential response to estrogen. So meds may feel like they work a little bit better in the first half of your menstrual cycle. We learned something. Isn't that cool? My point is that I think it's crazy that I don't think ADHD is the only diagnosis where this is true. I think it's crazy that for half the population, we don't think about this stuff. We're just like ADHD. Here's the med. Oh, by the way, it's going to be twice as effective in days two to 10 of your menstrual cycle. And by the way, you're going to be more susceptible to negative affect, which kind of makes sense, right? So if we feel worse post-menstruation, then a medication that makes us feel more euphoric will be more effective. This could even result in like very, very specific prescribing patterns of based on your ADHD and menstrual cycle, I'm going to recommend that you take a stimulant days two to 15. And as soon as you ovulate, you can stop the medication. Like, this could be the kind of specificity we could move towards. But we don't because we think about ADHD as static. It's crazy. Um, okay, so... How do I deal with doctors telling me adult ADHD doesn't exist and that it always turns into bipolar disorder? I have literally never heard a doctor say that. That boggles my mind. There is so much overwhelming evidence that I can think of that that is not true. I don't even know where to, I don't even know what to cite because it just defies our current understanding of medicine. I would need to see evidence of that. Now, I actually I mean I could I could engineer something that could suggest that which is more like okay if we look at adhd as impulsivity I, I can see how that some i could see how that could happen because you could have bipolar disorder with some degree of hypomania which then gets diagnosed as adhd and then as people grow older we discover that they never had adhd to begin with their distractibility, difficulty with concentration, et cetera, was actually a feature of bipolar disorder. So that I, I take that back. But I would say find a different doctor. Y yeah, so, so, so when people are saying like misdiagnosed with bipolar, I think bipolar is one of the most misdiagnosed diagnoses out there. Like, I think the, the prevalence of bipolar disorder is like 1%. Bipolar disorder is actually quite rare. Let me just double check. Yeah, so look at this. Oh, that's elderly. Okay, so like, look at this. So people don't, like, everyone's like, oh my God, he's bipolar. No, he's not. So bipolar disorders on oh, with a measured lifetime prevalence in 1%. Okay. This, this is older people. Where's the epidemiology? Okay. So lifetime prevalence of about 1% to 3% in the general population. Okay. However, reanalysis of the data, National Epidemiologic Catchment Area Survey of the United States is that 0.8% of the population has experienced one manic episode and 0.5% have a hypomanic episode. So like including sub threshold. It, so this is what I'm saying. It, it's very rare. 1% met lifetime prevalence of criteria for bipolar disorder, 1.1 for bipolar two and 2.4 for sub threshold symptoms. So bipolar disorder is quite rare. I mean, I don't always get these statistics right, and I'm relieved that I got that one right. 1% is still quite a lot. But if you compare it to the lifetime prevalence of major depressive disorder, let's take a look at that. It's going to be like 30%. It's crazy. Let's look.
Let's look at epidemiology. Okay, 8.4%. Um, Seventeen percent, ages eighteen to twenty-five. Um, twenty-five percent of women, ten percent of men. Right. So, so I mean, I want to say it's somewhere around thirty percent, but maybe I'm overshooting it a little bit. But it's at least ten times as common, if not fifteen to twenty times as common as bipolar disorder. Right. And I mean, like, I'm not like I'm not an epidemiologist. This is just like clinical perspectives, just like gut of how you practice. I'm not an expert in any of these conditions. Um, OK, so let's do one more and then call it a day. Are we? I, I'm kind of wiped, chat. <laughs> what are the dangers of combining ADHD meds and weed? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so this is absolutely a conversation for your doctor. But if y'all want a TLDR of combining ADHD meds and weed, it's kind of like asking the question, What's the downside of drying yourself off with a towel in the pool while you're swimming? Well, the downside is that the purpose of the towel is to dry yourself off. And then if you're in the water, it ain't going to do anything. So the most common thing about ADHD and, and weed is that the two substances are working to counteract each other. Okay? So weed is going to dull your focus. Is anxiolytic, which means it reduces your anxiety, is it kind of makes you chill out a little bit. Stimulant medication is going to do the opposite, right? It's like mixing an upper and a downer. So generally speaking, my experience as a psychiatrist is that when people are using substances, especially alcohol and marijuana, it reduces the efficacy of the stimulant medication that they take. So I think it's kind of like you're shooting yourself in the foot. Now, the flip side of that is that many people love doing it. And if they love doing it, we have to take a pretty serious look at why. So the other really interesting thing is that the flip side of the argument is that ADHD medication is anxiety inducing. So we know that one of the side effects of stimulant medication is to increase our anxiety. We know that ADHD medication can interfere with our ability to sleep. And so then the question is, why do we do why do we take marijuana? Because we were actually self-medicating the side effects of the ADHD medication. On the flip side, why do we take ADHD medication? Because we're self-medicating the side effects of marijuana. So marijuana chills us out, allows us to socialize, allows us to relax, allows us to get out of our own head, but dulls our senses and makes it difficult for us to concentrate. So we want to we want to sort of manage that with ADHD medication. So I don't think it's silly that people tend to use the two, and they love using the two. There are a couple of other concerns that you have to be super careful about. So we know that marijuana is actually a gateway drug. And what does that mean, it's a gateway drug? That means that the effect of marijuana on the developing brain, so if you're under the age of 28, marijuana has this effect on your brain, where it changes your dopamine circuitry and your nucleus accumbens architecture so that you are vulnerable to becoming addicted to euphoric substances. So it changes the way that your brain is, gets wired, which makes you vulnerable to other addictions. So that's what we've got to be kind of careful about. Now, on the flip side, we know that if people who take stimulant medication have an interesting relationship with developing addictions. Because on the one hand, it messes with your dopamine circuitry. But one of the things that we know is if you actually look at epidemiologic studies, people who are started on stimulant medication are less likely to become addicted later in life. And the question is why, if, it's, if it causes euphoria, what happens? Well, it turns out that stimulant medication 
enhances your frontal lobes. And your frontal lobes protect you against addiction. So it's like, it's complicated. I don't know if y'all followed like all the back and forth, but that's kind of what we know, right? Should I write that out? Or are y'all able to follow that? Okay, so someone's saying Russell Barkley say that THC can, uh, use causes more focus but less recall. So let's understand that for a second, right? So this is where like things get complicated. It's not like this thing good, this thing bad. So if we look at ADHD, we're highly distractible. We have lots of different thoughts. Our thoughts are all over the place. So any central nervous system depressant will slow down all of the excess thoughts and leave us with one or two thoughts. And the more we get left with one or two thoughts, the more it will feel like focus. But this is where my personal opinion is that a lot of psychiatrists do not study focus the way that yogis do. They don't really think about what is the nature of focus. So we're sort of slapping on this improves or disproves, but really you have to look at what is the actual mechanism in the mind through which CNS depressants can help ADHD. So we'll give people stimulants and we'll, people will say, okay, if I take a stimulant, it helps me focus my mind. If I literally stimulate my brain, I focus my mind more easily. If I give myself a central nervous system depressant like alcohol or marijuana, that also allows me to focus. How is that possible? Well, it's very simple. When we stimulate, the part of the brain that we're stimulating is the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are the brakes of our brain, not the gas pedal. So what they help us do is they help us slow down. They rein in the impulsive and distractible parts of our mind. So I'm stimulating my break, which allows me to slow down. Then I can give a CNS depressant, which slows down. The end result is the same. In both cases, we're slowing down. Right? Does that make sense? Could walking the path of the Aghori help someone cope with ADHD? Does their yogic perspective differ from others as a cope? What an interesting question. Mm. So I'm, I'm putting out a video soon, hopefully. I'll record maybe on Wednesday morning about meditation and ADHD. So it's one that I've already like scripted out and stuff, but I'm going to have to think about a gory. I'd have to really think about that question for a little bit. So is it too late for a drug addict who wants to quit to try stimulants? No, no. I mean, there's actually like a decent amount of evidence that treating ADHD with stimulant medication helps people become sober. So for a long time, we thought as a field that if someone has a history of addiction, don't give them an addictive substance. But it turns out that a lot of people have a drug of choice, right? Their brain is not vulnerable to all addictions. Um, that there are specifically, usually we, people have a drug of choice. So an alcoholic can still, for example, smoke cigarettes and like be okay, or even use marijuana or something like that. Um, and what we know is that, like we said, ADHD medication helps us actually restrain impulses. There's some data that shows that actually improves addictions. But that's where, like, you really need a good clinician to help you decide, like, what's your threshold, what's the risk benefit, etc. Okay. Um, what if weed is only used for the come down of stimulants? Would you still consider this drying in the pool? So here's what I'd say in general. I'd say if that if you're using one substance to counteract the effect of another substance, that's not really a great way to do things. So the simple truth of the matter is that the body is way better at self-regulating than we are. So your body's natural ability to regulate its mood, go to sleep, wake up, is far superior to caffeine plus a sedative. And so I'd say that, generally speaking, doing both 
is less healthy than doing neither. There are some exceptions to that. But if we kind of think about it, like these stimulants and depressants are like blunt instruments. We're flooding our body with a particular chemical that hits all of our tissues and has all kinds of effects. There's no balance. The thing about the human body that's really cool is there's all kinds of intrinsic balance. A really good example of this, it's wild. So if we have this hormone called cortisol, cortisol does a couple of interesting things. One is it increases the inflammation that we experience. It increases our heart rate. It increases our blood pressure. It makes us more mentally stressed. We feel more mentally stressed. And it floods our bloodstream with sugar. Now, since it does all of these different things, each of these things goes back and regulates cortisol. So there's a really interesting set of studies that show that in trauma, people who have been traumatized have high levels of cortisol. And those high levels of cortisol increase their hypervigilance, make it hard for them to go to sleep. The world is dangerous. And the cortisol is doing that to your brain. So really cool studies show that eating beta-glucans, which are some of the substances in mushrooms, that regulate your blood sugar will actually go back and reduce your cortisol level. So even if we want cortisol increases our heart rate, makes us more mentally stressed, and increases our blood sugar. If we can eat stuff that lowers our blood sugar, that will kind of go back and feed back and reduce the cortisol and then result in a lower blood pressure, lower heart rate, and lower stress level. So you can eat mushrooms to lower your stress level. This is in the case of someone who's, who's got a high level of cortisol and a history of trauma. So this is, the, this is the sophistication of the way that our whole body and mind and brain are like a network of all of these interplaying pieces. Another good example of this is we have bacteria in our gut that produce neurotransmitter precursors. So they produce the compounds that become serotonin and dopamine and epinephrine and norepinephrine. So the food that we eat will influence our neurotransmitter pr uh, production. Okay. Yeah, we can do a meditation stream. Uh, I don't know which mushrooms specifically have beta-glucans. I know they're in mushrooms. I don't know which ones. I don't know if it's like shiitake or whatever. Okay. Um, so I need to eat mushrooms to reduce my cortisol. I don't... Uh, maybe. Hold on. Let's see. I don't remember the population... For that that study, so beta glucan cortisol. Let's see. Okay, yeah. So it does look like it works. Let's take a quick look. Right. So beta glucan induced cortisol levels improve the early immune response in matrinxa. That's not humans. Um. Beta-glucan reduces cortisol plasma levels, enhances innate immune system after ahydrophilia inoculation. This looks like it could be... Yeah, so these aren't human studies. <laughs> so, let's see. Yeah, this is like fish and shellfish, dude. Aquaculture. Wow. So it looks like what they're doing is, um, it looks like they're using beta glucans in like fish farms to reduce their cortisol and level up their immune system so that fish farms don't, they don't, they're less susceptible to bacteria. That's next level. So it looks like they're feeding fish mushrooms to keep them healthy. That's next level. <laughs> dude like i love science like I, I don't know if you can make an extrapolation for humans but 
Yeah. Am I a millionaire? No. I don't think so anyway. I wish. Um, okay. So take care, everybody. This was fun. Okay, so let me ask y'all before I go. How was this? So we covered some posts. We did some stuff. We, you know, is, does it feel like y'all are happy with this? Some back and forth. Can ADHD be cured through working on oneself or can only medication help with the problem? I don't know if ADHD can be cured, but it can absolutely, you can absolutely work on yourself to the point where ADHD does not affect your life in a negative way. You can learn to live with it. Okay, you wish I did this when I wasn't working. Well, that's what VODs are for. Although I love having people live. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. So thank you all very much. We're streaming. We have our uh, members stream this Wednesday on developing healthy masculinity. If y'all are unfamiliar with memberships, we just launched this feature. So a couple of things to keep in mind. The first is that memberships do not affect or reduce any of the free content that we make. Um, the reason we started doing memberships is because as we've started building YouTube videos and stuff like that, like, let me just show y'all real quick. Hopefully this will like just explain. Um, so if we look at our YouTube channel, what we find is that we have some videos that are like, you know, so this is a 20 minute video that has 700,000 views. It's a great video. Um, and then we, if you guys just kind of go down and you look at our like longer videos, they don't do as well. So like, here's a two hour interview. That's like 85,000, you know, so like our, our long form content doesn't just doesn't perform as well, which doesn't mean that we don't make it right. We're here on stream for two hours today. And like, that's fine. Like we're okay doing that. But one of the things that we found is if, if we're trying to help the most people possible, making something that more people will watch. Like, so we had a video about why therapy sucks for men that has, I think, like well over a million views. I don't know if it's like 1.1 or 1.7 or whatever. Um, and, and so it, we're trying to make stuff that people on YouTube like. Now, the problem is that I'm tired of making 20 minute videos, although I'm going to continue making them. But I, I really want to go back to doing like in-depth lectures. And so we're going to do that on stream like today, and we'll continue to do that. We still occasionally do that and fuck the performance sometimes, right? So we have to sort of balance that. But for those of y'all, there's been a, a, a big demand in our community for people who want more. So like back to one hour lectures. And what I'm excited about is y'all get to decide what the topics are. So every month on the 15th, y'all vote for what topics you want me to prepare lectures on. I'm going to prepare those lectures. There are going to be one hour lectures that will be more academic, more in-depth, and even more applicable. If you guys want to do things like skills-based workshops and stuff like that, we can do that too. Cost is 10 bucks a month and helps fuel our free content, right? So I know this is kind of confusing, but the more free stuff we make, the more it costs us. So that money's got to come from somewhere. And thus far, we don't do a whole lot of fundraising drives. We haven't taken capital investment. We're super careful about our sponsorships. Just to give you all kind of a, a sense of scale, we get some sponsorship offers that would pay us in one month what we would make in a whole year of YouTube memberships. And we turn those down because we turn those down. And we're, we're doing memberships because I want to go back to making that content. This is an additional thing that I'm trying that substitutes for other stuff that I do has nothing to do with the free content that we make. So if y'all are interested, it's 10 bucks a month for four lectures that are one hour each that are delivered live with Q&A. And then even we're considering an extra Q&A like 60 minute or 90 minute stream or something like that, specifically for questions that are asked by the community. And we're really grateful for everyone who's signed up because I get to make more lectures doing more advanced topics and y'all get to decide what it is. So instead of Dr. K trying to figure out, okay, this is what I'm going to talk about today, y'all tell me and I'm, I'll make it. Um, I, I like long content too. 
That's kind of why we're doing it. And just a reminder that this doesn't mean that all of our long content is going to be members content. We'll continue doing two hour streams and stuff like that. We've got a couple of deep dives planned that we're still planning on doing. But y'all get to decide. So if y'all are interested in that, sign up. We really appreciate everyone who signs up. It really helps us do the work that we want to do. And then there's also a second tier at 15 bucks a month for people who want to give us additional money. You'll get access to some beta features and things like that, but really it's for people who want to support the work that we're doing. We've tried to made it, make it as affordable and accessible as possible. So we also have other services like coaching and stuff that'll be anywhere from like 20 to 30 bucks to 50 bucks a month, a week, which is really out of the reach for a lot of people. Even some people will say guides at $25 a pop are too expensive. So we're trying to give you all content that is even more affordable. And so, you know, even less than the price of cosmetic horse armor. Um, okay. So thank you all very much. And uh, is there a way to do membership that doesn't give YouTube my card? Not yet. But I would, yeah, not yet. But we're working on, so we're, we recognize that doing this may be like leaving behind our Twitch subs and things like that. So we're trying to figure out some way where there's like, it's hard, but we're trying to figure out how to give like everyone the same stuff. Okay. So take care, everybody. Thank you all very much for coming today and good luck with everything. Will the videos be archived? Absolutely. And there's even some talk uh, from members about, you know, some members were saying like, okay, like maybe we should share this with other people, like the, the rest of the community. And like, we're going to talk about that kind of stuff. Um, if I join memberships, can I watch older membership content? That depends on the YouTube platform, but I think the answer is yes. Right? And and we so here's the thing. We're we're when we launch memberships, we're trying to do more for the community. And we recognize that not everything is for everyone. And so that's where, like, honestly, if we, so let's say that we replaced our existing content with the content that we're planning on doing, which is one hour lectures a week. If that's what our content became, our YouTube channel would tank. And then the question becomes, okay, like, is it okay for it to tank? Well, like, if our, if we had taken that attitude from the beginning, chances are 90% of y'all wouldn't be here today because you would have never heard of us because we didn't play the YouTube game. So we're trying to actually do both. We're trying to balance making in-depth content with doing stuff that is generally accessible. And this is sort of the solution we've come up with for now. So I'm super excited about it because I want to make like more in-depth lectures. I'm really excited about the lecture we have coming up on Wednesday about masculinity. What is healthy max masculinity? What is toxic masculinity? And how to develop healthy masculinity? Um, and then I'm also excited about doing this, which is like, let's talk about ADHD. So we're going to try to do more for y'all because y'all want more. So take care, everybody. Love y'all and enjoy the rest of your day.